now live. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I will call the Social Service Committee for Wednesday, April 7th, 2021 to order. And uh, today's meeting is being clerked by Emma Vokes and attendance has been noted by the clerk. And I will note that um, I did receive regrets from uh, Mayor Kevin Davis uh, for today's meeting. So I will just review our rules of procedure. I would like to uh, remind uh, the committee that our viewing public of a few procedural rules for our virtual meetings and, oper uh, and operating as efficiently as possible. All members must be muted for the meeting to reduce feedback. All web cameras for committee members shall be turned on. Staff will be requested to join the video meeting should the need to answer questions of members of committee arise. Committee members should indicate they wish to speak by pressing the raise hand button on the participation uh, list screen, bottom right hand side. Clerk staff will lower the hand when you have recognized the chair uh, for your speaking opportunity. And in the event of a connection service interruption occurs uh, that affects quorum of the committee, we may recess for up to 15 minutes to regain quorum. And if quorum is not achieved, the meeting will be adjourned. Uh, so members of committee, are there any declarations of curinary interest in uh, any of the items appearing in today's social service agenda? Okay, seeing none. Uh, at this time, I'll ask members of the committee what items they would like to have uh, separated for discussion purposes. Uh, Councilor Rentoski. Thank you. 5.1.1, Ontario's vision for social assistance, please. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, Councilor Bell. Uh, 5.2.1, please. Okay, thank you. And uh, with that, I will uh, I'm gonna please get a mover and a seconder for any of the motions, uh, on the, for the motions to approve all items uh, that have not been separated for discussion purposes, please. So that's moved by Councillor Sless and seconded by uh, Councillor Rentoski. And uh, just a reminder to um, committee members, if you could make sure your names are changed, uh, on Zoom, please. And so uh, with the mover and a seconder, I will call the questions. All those in favor? Thank you, that carries. And uh, with the separations, we go to 5.1.1 and that was Councillor Rentoski. Thank you, Chair Weaver. I'm just uh, looking for an update from staff on this, please. You might answer some of my questions as well. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Weaver and members of the committee. It's Susan Evenden, Director of Family and Income Stability. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak a little bit to this item because uh, I do recognize that we have come to this committee with a number of updates on items that are, are um, changing at the provincial level for the delivery of social assistance. And so you may recall recently, uh, we have updated you on some of the items in that uh, relate to the province's renewal and recovery plan, such as the centralized intake that we are part of prototyping, um, the employment services transition. And there was always this bigger question of what's, where is this going? We knew it was leading somewhere in terms of what the province intended to do with the delivery of social assistance, but we weren't sure exactly what so this announcement that the report speaks to that actually came in February, um, I think that that clears up that question um, and really sets at this point a broad vision. There are definitely a lot of details over the next couple of years that will be forthcoming. But um, the big reveal uh, is that the province intends to take back the delivery of eligibility and financial um, support functions uh, that they do pay 100% of the benefit costs currently and 100% of the delivery costs in ODSP. So for ODSP and OW, um, the city will no longer have a role at, at uh, sort of final state in financial eligibility functions. There is definitely is still some um, discussion of what's entailed um, in the financial benefits and there may be some, um, some of the more discretionary uh, benefits that may remain for delivery at the local level, but certainly the core benefits um, under the Ontario Works Act, the intention is that those would move to centralized provincial delivery. And so what that uh, means for us locally is that they're looking to municipal uh, services to support what we think of as case management services or, or individual support services that are not financial to individuals. So as you can imagine, uh, there's definitely been a lot of uncertainty and, uh, and I think, you know, anxiety um, within our, our staff um, about this change. 
Um, and as we've been able to kind of digest it and think about what it means, um, you know, I, I think what I'd like to suggest is that there's a real opportunity here. Um, and because the municipalities do pay half of the cost of the delivery of the program, I think that what this will allow us to do ultimately is to create something that's more like a, um, you know, a hub for social care um, and where we'll be able to help people navigate systems um, and also provide that higher level of support to individuals that, that need it. And, and what's been signaled from the province is that we will have the opportunity to assist people other than those we assist right now because they're receiving financial benefits. So OW and ODSP clients. So individuals who perhaps are, are older and are receiving pensions or, and need some, you know, a little bit of support in navigating systems, people who are low income and working, um, you know, I think this opens up the opportunity for us to be more supportive to a broader range of citizens. And I can actually give you a, a you know, sort of real life example that's happening in the county um, with the great support of county staff that when the new health hub opens later this summer or early fall we will have a, a designated location our staff will be there and so as this um, vision unfolds I can see and I think we can all see how beneficial that will be if a healthcare practitioner has a patient who needs social supports beyond what the medical system has to offer then our staff will be there to help connect them um, to those supports so I think there's uh, there's certainly an opportunity for this to really uh, be a game changer for our role going forward. Councillor Toski, did you want to continue? Thank you, Chair Weaver, and, and, and thank you. So you did end up um, kind of answering one of my concerns because you read this and it all sounds lovely and efficient and, you know, great on paper, but my concern was the removal from you know, the one step removal from the people who are sitting in front of our residents and our clients. And um, you have once again managed to find the opportunity. So so hearing about uh, being able to build out the social hub in, in a more effective way um, gives me some, some peace of mind as this goes forward. I know there's still a lot of questions. So thank you for that, that good explanation. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Miller, uh, you, you had your hand up and you put it down. And now it's back up. Is that you wanted to speak to this item? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was uh, I was going to wait until uh, I heard the presentation to see if some of my questions were answered. Just a couple too, um, through you to the presenter. Understanding that we're still early days, um, just a couple questions around the caseworkers themselves. Do you foresee in this all else being equal? In other words, the same number of. Uh, clients being looked after. Do you see the number of caseworkers increasing because they're looking at more duties? Um, th so through the chair, uh, thank you for that question. That's a good question. Um, I think it's too early to say definitively. Um, I think we'll have to see how some of the other um, programs that are, are currently underway that are, um, you know, in some ways streamlining and, um, and automating some of the functions that our caseworkers had had previously done. We'll have to see the impact of that um, and then weigh that against, as you say, uh, larger numbers of people being served and perhaps more intensity. What I can tell you is uh, right now, the province is communicating that as we see some of the benefits, uh, we're not seeing them yet, but some of the benefits of some of the, you know, centralized intake and employment transition, it is not their expectation that we reduce staff. It's our, their expectation that we redeploy those staff, as you suggest, to better support clients. Okay. And, and again, reiterating, it's still early. Um, can the caseworker of today do the work that's envisioned or will they need a bit of retraining, major retraining, re-educating, um, because to me it seems like the job description I think we might have lost uh, the counselor he was freezing. Um, so uh, Susan, could you answer that question the best you could with that yes. information? Yes. Oh, oh, um, yes. Actually, yes. sorry, Susan, uh, the counselor's back on. Okay. Councilor Miller, uh, was there anything you wanted to finish off with that, or should we get? Um... Oh, just uh, I apologize. I got the ter worst internet connection. Uh, just yeah. Do you, do you see them? Do you see major retraining needed for the caseworker today, or maybe maybe 
there's got to be some retraining. I'm just wondering what 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 extent you see as far as that goes. Um, yes, thank you. Throw the chair. Uh, another good question. Very intuitive. Uh, this is something that is already in process. Uh, you know, as through our professional development program, I think that um, you know, I think that our staff currently take a holistic uh, role. So they are already, the caseworkers are already supporting clients with a number of issues in their life. However, I, do they need to deepen their understanding of, um, you know, various conditions? You know, absolutely. Um, do they need to make sure that their toolbox is current, um, you know, and that we're using, you know, something that's going to be very important for us is to use evidence-based um, or proven techniques, um, you know, that, that we know help people to move their life forward. So we will have, we have and will continue to invest in um, a very robust training program. Uh, and what this allows us to do is shift our resources. A lot of our training resources right now go towards the technical aspects of the job. And this has always historically, and this committee knows, something that we've um, struggled with is because the program is so complex, because the technologies that we've been given are often imperfect. We spend a lot of time trying to coach staff and and bring their skills up on the technical side of the job. And so this will really open the opportunity for them to focus on the other aspect of their job. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I, I think if I was a caseworker, I, I'd, I'd, I would be excited about the changes coming and I, and I hope they are. So, okay, appreciate the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Miller. I have uh, Councillor Sluss followed by uh, Councillor Ferrier. Councillor Sluss, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Susan, will. Will this take away our ability to react to uh, special cases where, where th there's an oddity and, and we can then accommodate somebody financially that is maybe in a position that we don't, uh, that the system doesn't anticipate, but uh, we've always been able to somehow make accommodation and get that person over whatever hump they're facing and, and move them on. Uh, does this take that ability away once the province starts to take control of the financial end of this? Um, through the chair. So I'll answer that in two ways. The first would be that um, right now the Ontario Works legislation is it's written in such a way that it's, um, I would say it has a lot of gray area or discretion. And that's the space that we operate in um, to look at individual circumstances. And that is the intention. Um, so I don't know, it's not clear right now um, to what extent there may be legislative changes to the program. And if there aren't, then how provincial staff will be um, trained and guided around that discretion. So I guess that is a possibility. And, uh, and if that is the case, um, then we would look to other avenues, perhaps discretionary envelopes of funding that we would have uh, access to, and certainly um, advocating and, um, you know, attempting to intervene on the client's behalf. Okay. And then just finally, if I could, Mr. Chair, uh, it, it always raises a red flag for me when, when the government is making, and the provincial government is making uh, major changes with the statement, uh, there will be no financial impact to municipalities. Uh, I've been around 30 some years and I've never seen that be true. Um, th there's a hit coming here. I'm not sure in which direction we're going to get hit from, but we're going to get hit financially. I, I think that's a given. Uh, the minute they say the statement, uh, there will be no financial impact to, <clears throat> to local communities. Uh, do you know where we're most vulnerable? Um, through the chair, uh, not as yet. Um, as the report indicates, there is a high-level committee. It's shrouded in secrecy, and we're not at the table. Um, the provincial municipal, um, you know, sort of high-level group that's discussing funding. I think that is the area where the administrating administrative funding formula will shift. Right now, they're signaling 2023 as possible implementation for that. So I think that will answer, when that work becomes public, that will probably answer your question, Councillor. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Slass. Uh, Councillor Ferrier, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Susan, and, and great discussion and questions and back and forth so far. Um, I, I want to talk about on page five of your report, page seven of our package, under section C, it says, uh, co-designing the social assistance system, the province is taking an integrative approach to municipally delivered programs, as well as building better connections between programs in the community. I want to talk about that piece and ask you a question about that as it relates actually to the health hub piece you've just brought up as well uh, in the county of Brant. And, and thank you for the kind words about county staff on that. Um, 
my, my question is regarding this, uh, there, there have been some changes over the course of the last decade in social assistance delivery. There seems to be more coming down the pike. And we were talking about training of social services staff, but I want to I want to talk about the uh, the notion of social services staff training other community groups, other community members about some of these changes. Uh, and as you may remember, I, when I was a, a full-time social worker coming to your offices and doing a training for some of your folks to help them integrate better with the medical models that we see at the Grand River Community Health Center, what was happening where um, your workers were saying to folks, rightfully so, hey, you can have health care. Uh, you know, I, I know you're a, a person who lives with a disability, though it's not uh, something you claim ODSP for, which would be a much better social situation, et cetera. Uh, but what was actually happening in reality are people without people who hadn't seen doctors in a really long time were coming to doctors and immediately saying, put me on ODSP, help me get on ODSP, to which doctors and nurse practitioners were saying, you're asking me to commit fraud. I've only just met you. And it's creating a lot of issues there for the service users and a lot of issues for the doctors and nurse practitioners. Um, when we move into this health hub uh, in the county, is it possible, especially with all of these changes coming, for your staff to maybe design and develop some training for um, those medical practitioners and other medical practitioners in the community, maybe it can be recorded via Zoom, to get them up to date on some of these issues, some of these service delivery pieces, and, and so that your clients aren't sort of vilified by some other professionals as fraudulent or trying to game the system when really they've been living with these medical issues, some of them for decades and haven't had them addressed, let alone addressed through the social services system. Is that something that we can sort of preload uh, as opposed to catching up five, six years from now with a lot of misunderstanding in the way? Uh, through the chair, yes, thank you, Councillor LaFerrier. Um, you know, and that's a wonderful suggestion, and I don't see any reason why we can't m begin to move forward with that. Um, I think that uh, both in Brantford and Brant County, um, something that we're going to be working, knowing this direction, we're going to be working very cl uh, closely with uh, our partners in the medical community. I think the development of the Ontario health teams um, at this point in time is, is an interesting thing that's happening concurrently, and, um, you know, I think that there are opportunities for us to link up, um, you know, through that model as well and do exactly what you're suggesting. And, and I think you're absolutely right that there are um, sort of misunderstandings and misconceptions on, on both sides. And what we need is, is more common understanding of how we can work together uh, better for the benefit of those that we serve. Thank you. Okay, uh, great discussion. Uh, I don't see any other hands up. So I just have one question really, um, uh, Councillor Sless sort of already asked it, but just my question. Um, have we taken a look at this new system and have we seen any gaps that um, the municipality is going to have to pick up? Um, so through the chair, uh, thank you for the question, or through, uh, thank you for the question, Chair Weaver. And I think that it's... <laughs> to use a you know, sort of overused quote, the devil's in the details and we don't have those yet. So it's a little difficult to answer that question. Um, but I think that, you know, our service, you know, as long as I've ever been involved, um, we have always been in a position of, um, you know, of identifying gaps advocating um, that some of those gaps really do not belong in within the municipal um, system and on the, the tax base of the municipality um, and attempting sometimes successfully, often not successfully, but uh, attempting to advocate for those uh, issues to be funded at the appropriate level of government. Um, so with that long history, I guess my suggestion would be, yes, we will probably have that experience as, as we start to uh, move into this final state. Okay, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, seeing no other questions, I'll call the question on item 5.1.1. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that carries, thank you. Uh, the next item, 5.2.1. I'm sorry, I didn't document who separated. I think it might have been Councillor Miller. Oh, it was Councillor Bell, I apologize. Go ahead, Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, it's, it's always a uh, good day when the government gives you a lot of money. Uh, four and a half million dollars to uh, aid social services relief is very welcome and the way in which it's been spent uh, looks to be really appropriate apart from one issue that, that I need a bit of clarity for and this may not be the right time to address it but I'm interested in 
in your se in section four of the report where we talk about funding to assist with the construction of a new 25 unit affordable housing building and, and my question is, is is that the best and greatest use of money that is intended for social services relief secondary questions relate to did I miss something in this committee? Because I don't recall ever seeing this being brought forward to the Social Services Committee. The first I saw of it was actually in the Brantford Expositor. And it's a, an ambitious project, both in terms of cost and time. And I was surprised when I looked through the Mayor's um, Affordable Housing Task Force report, I couldn't find this item. So I would like to have a better understanding of how this came about why we didn't see it here and whether we're actually using the money from the government in the best way. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Bell. Just before we start, I just want to preempt the conversation. Um, are we able to discuss our funding options on this project yet? Uh, <clears throat> good morning, Mary Ellen McClellan, uh, Director of Housing and Homelessness. Uh, we can just, uh, through Chair Weaver, uh, we can discuss the build in itself, and but not necessarily uh, in relation to the funding. If that helps. Okay. Um, perhaps a, a conversation um, aside from this meeting, um, maybe a memo to our, our councillor colleagues, just because um, there is some in-camera items that um, we don't want to we don't want to discuss at this moment, and we're not able to unfortunately. We can explain why later, but um, so uh, Councillor Bell, please ask your question again, and Mary Ellen will do the best she can to answer. I'm not sure I can ask it very differently. Um, first thing is the first question is: Is this the best and greatest use of 1.25 million dollars of government funding that was originally intended for social services relief? The second one is, why are we just hearing about this project now? Why did it not come to Social Services Committee earlier? Uh, and if I follow the line along, could you be clear about the contribution that the county has to make to this project? Yes, Sir Chair Weaver. Uh, I can say that uh, I'll start with the why in terms of what we have noticed uh, through, well, historically and more certainly more exaggerated through uh, the last year is individuals living in uh, shelters, those older individuals living in shelters who really have no other option and nowhere to go that can serve their needs. We know that we know that uh, sheltering those individuals is a very expensive proposition, and we feel that a more permanent solution for those older individuals and having somewhere to go is the best way to, to meet their social services needs. We know that having a roof over your house is kind of a fundamental human right for moving forward. It, it al will allow the individuals struggling right now to, to access uh, the ability to have food in their kitchen and not have to go to food banks or, or other areas to receive meals. It would allow them to perhaps even uh, seek employment opportunities. Pretty well anything that we would normally do starts with that roof over your head. So we see that as a fundamental uh, Serve, social service uh, piece. So it would, uh, it would take uh, 25 individuals out of the sheltering system, provide them with that roof, allow them to become healthier uh, and function as any other individual would. Um, and it's, um, it would be there in perpetuity and certainly would be a lot cheaper than the option that we have now. So that is the why. In terms of um, the other second part of the question, why you haven't heard of this particular uh, build, I believe there have been um, two, oh, sorry, I take that back, at least one media release out uh, that we are looking at that particular property in Ward 1 to uh, proceed with this building. Uh, we, are, we are entertaining a consultation plan 
not shouldn't say entertaining, we are starting that process. Uh, it will begin relatively shortly. We will be going out to the community with some with some with some ideas. Uh, we do know that we are proposing that the bottom floor of that building be some commercial space. So we will be looking for input from the community at large. Um, and um, we will certainly be listening to the concerns of the community and trying to alleviate the, those concerns. So we have gone out with a media release prior to this. So again, my apologies if it hasn't been as widely out there as we would have liked, but um, we are moving towards a consultation. Mr. Chair, I'm really struggling with this. Um, I was very much in favour of the Mayor's Affordable Housing Task Force project. I enjoyed reading the report. Uh, this is the first affordable housing project that comes along. It's not on that report. Uh, so I struggle with that. I, I struggle with why we have not seen it at social services till now. I struggle to understand how it is being funded. And I struggle to understand what contribution the county makes to this. I still haven't. Uh, I, I appreciate the answer from Mary Ellen about it helps 25 people, but the social services relief fund, I think was not intended to help a 25 people. It was in, intended to help a, a much larger group of people in the community. And, and this seems to be I think inappropriately focused. So I've, I've got concerns on many, many levels. Okay. Did you have any other specific questions uh, for staff, Councillor Bell? Uh, only I would like answers to the questions I've already asked, which I haven't received yet. Okay, and so specifically, I think the one question was why, um, what, what the percentage is of county participation in this project, is that correct? Uh, and why did we not hear about it at social services before it went out as a media release? Okay, thank you. Uh, through Chair Weaver, the, uh, the particular build did come to social services. Um, I don't have the report in front of me, but it was at social services and was indeed approved at social services. Uh, so that is what I can say. It came as, as its own build uh, to accommodate those 25 homeless individuals over the um, the. Uh, age of 55. Um, Kevin, um, I'm, I'm going to call on Kevin O'Hara. He'll have more depth in terms of the social service relief fund program, but it did come with a capital component. So Chair Weaver, may I ask the question, when did it come to social services? Could, could we get, I, I might have missed it and I accept I may have missed one thing, but I don't think I've missed it. Um, that's no problem at all, Councillor Belt. What I'll do is I'll ask staff to um, resend out that, that report to um, committee. Okay. okay um, Kevin, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, it's Kevin O'Hara, Manager of Housing Stability. Great to see everybody this morning, and thank you for the questions, Councillor Bell. Um, so the, I, I understand your concerns around the Social Services Relief Funding and, and the intended purpose of that fund, the province did allow for some capital components as part of that relief program. And as I'm sure uh, all, all of the committee can appreciate, this is a lot of money uh, that the province has provided. And we are spending a lot of money on people uh, to provide one-time services, very valuable services. A food program, for example, is reaching members across uh, the whole Brant County and, and Brantford and Six Nations. It's uh, through the food bank program. Um, so those funds that are flowing out to help people are really making a difference. And, and we thank the province for that. But the province did allow for um, in phase two of the social services relief funding program, they had a holdback amount. And that holdback amount was released in December of 2020. And the stipulation was that we had to spend it on operating costs by March 31st of this year if we designated it towards operating costs. Staff really struggled as to how we would spend all of that money because it was over $2 million on operating costs by March 31st. Um, so there is a capital component to do some renovations as, in the, as stated in the report for some of our existing shelter providers. And staff felt through the Emergency Operations Committee, and, and as Mary Ellen has said, it, uh, it did come to a report 
that if we actually build a, a legacy out of this program that gets people out of the shelter system and provides housing to people, it ties in certainly to the Mayor's Housing Partnerships Task Force in that we're providing a, an ultimate solution for, for folks to get them out of shelter, which costs $65 per bed night, um, into housing that costs far less, about half that cost, uh, if it uh, at least. Um, so that was the intent of staff is to really make the difference with that amount, which is a, a portion of the total amount provided. And then of course, the province has released social services relief funding phase three, uh, which is also provided in the report, which continues to enhance those other services that I think you're concerned about, Councillor Bell, uh, delivering those uh, supports to people that really need it, that are vulnerable in the community to help them stay where they live. Uh, if they have arrears to, to provide food security programs, to provide uh, pro personal protective equipment to our shelter providers to continue to provide the isolation shelter as well. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Councillor Bell, you are over your time. Would you like me to put you back in the queue? I'd be yes, happy please. to do that. Okay, yes, no problem. Um, so first time speaker, I have uh, Councillor Ferrier. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, through you to staff. Um, my, my questions are um, more about the process piece here. Um, when the city's housing uh, reserve, affordable housing reserve, um, my understanding is, and just correct me if I'm wrong, that the funding uh, portions of it come from what's left over uh, sort of in the kitty uh, from the social services and housing budget. Is that correct? Uh, through Chair Weaver, sorry, uh, the, I think the question was, is it correct that the balance of social services goes into the housing reserve? Uh, so the answer is not in entirely. Uh, it depends on what indeed that the, the surplus is from. If it's surplus received from a housing provider that didn't spend all of their funding in, a, in one particular year, 50% of that, of that surplus would in fact go into our housing reserve. Okay, so, so through you, Mr. Chair, I, uh, to, to Mary Ellen, and, and thank you for that. Um, I'm just trying to ascertain if county ratepayer monies go into the city of Brantford affordable housing reserve in some way, shape or form. And if so, I just want to make sure that when that money is used, you know, as the county, do we have, you know, rights to vote at this table and the housing corporation table on those funds or, or not um, based on our agreements? Because I know in the county, we, we have our new affordable housing reserve and it comes completely from um, uh, county sources, no, no, no city share. <clears throat> So, um, indeed, the county dollars do do contribute to social housing uh, and indeed do pr contribute to the housing providers um, uh, as well. Uh, so that indeed, if there is surplus in those areas, it does make it into the housing reserve. Um, there are other uh, components of um, uh, that will also make it into the reserve, such as the sale of the woodlawn units that uh, mm -hmm. that is intended to provide for additional uh, rent gear to income new development units as we move forward. Um, so if that answers your yeah. question. So, so, so then my last question is not to be answered now. I just, I'm wondering if three, Mr. Chair, I can ask that at a future meeting, um, we maybe have some clarity on um, the the process, but but actually more to the point, the agreement between the city and the county for this table or the, the housing corporation table about um, whether the county is giving up, uh, potentially giving up any any um, democratic um, processes with county tax rate payer monies, um, or if that's part of an agreement, if that's in the agreement that, you know, once it's in the city's housing reserve, the city gets to decide fully and completely how to use it, that's fine. But I just want clarity on that one way or the other, or if it's not stated at all, maybe we need to discuss that. Um, so if we could do that in the future, um, that, that'd be that'd be wonderful. It doesn't have to be right now. I just want to sort of, if it's okay, Mr. Chair, I want to highlight that as something maybe we should discuss as a group over the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And uh, any first time opportunities for this item? Okay, we'll go back to Councillor Bell. Councillor Bell, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Councillor Ferry asked the questions I was going to ask. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, so seeing no other questions, uh, I'll call the question on this item. So uh, if you're in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you, that carries. Uh, there are no resolutions. There are no notices of motions. Uh, members of the committee, are there any questions of staff related to any, related to the mandate of the social service committee? Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a question that was raised in our, in our council meeting uh, when we were talking about a number of other issues. Could we get an update from staff on the Trillium Way uh, extension project? Uh, good morning. Uh, okay, so in terms of, uh, we do have Deb Schlichter on as well, who has further depth. We can say that uh, we are currently working on the Trillium Way report. Uh, so perhaps Deb can give a more fulsome um, update. Yes. Um, good morning, uh, Deb Schlichter, Manager of Housing Programs. Um, there is a report through you to uh, Chair, uh, there is a report coming forward for the May 5th uh, uh, Social Services Committee about the Trillium Way development. It's um, an update with some funding being proposed. Um, we're reporting also about the outcome of the Rapid Housing Initiative, which we had applied for for this particular program. And that is currently on hold. We've been notified that that's currently on hold uh, as the, the federal um, CMHC uh, group has uh, not had enough funding to, to, to cover all the projects that had uh, put in submissions. So at this point, um, we're bringing an update report with a different way of trying to fund this particular uh, development on Trillium Way and that will be coming forward to this committee on May the 5th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Any other questions? Okay, uh, seeing no other questions, um, the meeting for social service committee will now be adjourned and we will launch ourselves into the Brant and Brantford Local Housing Corporation Board of Directors. And uh, just before we begin, uh, Councilor McCreary, I have my neighbor building a fence right outside my window. So if it gets a little loud, I'll have to uh, defer the committee uh, meeting to you, okay? Fair enough, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the meeting for the Brantford Local Housing Corporation Board of Directors is now called to order. Uh, roll call has been noted by the clerk. And uh, members of the committee, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest for any of the items appearing on the Brant and Brantford Local Housing Corporation Board of Directors agenda? Okay, seeing none, uh, there are no presentations or delegations on today's agenda. And uh, we do have some items. Uh, so does committee wish to have any of the items on today's agenda uh, separated for discussion purposes? Okay, uh, seeing none, I will uh, ask for a mover and a seconder for all items. So moved by Councillor Antosky, seconded by Councillor McCreary. Uh, I will call the question on all items on the agenda uh, for consideration and consent. So all those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you, that does carry. And uh, we have no resolutions and there are no notices of motion that I'm aware of. Uh, and with that, uh, we'd like to thank our, our council colleagues and we'll call this meeting uh, adjourned. And uh, we'll just give our council colleagues uh, from the county a couple of minutes to uh, leave or stay if you wish to, 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 to spectate our next meeting. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Okay, um, so uh, the meeting for the Brantford Municipal Non-Housing, Non-Profit Housing Corporation Board of Directors is now called to order. Roll call has been noted by the clerk and the members of the committee, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest on any of the items appearing on the Brantford Municipal Non-Profit Housing Corporation Board of Directors agenda? Thank you, seeing none. There are no presentations or delegations. Uh, does the committee wish to separate any of the items on today's agenda? Okay, uh, seeing no uh, separations, can I please get a mover and a seconder for all items? Moved by Councillor Sless, seconded by Councillor Antosky, thank you very much. Uh, 
I'll call the vote on all those items. So please raise your hand if you agree. That carries, thank you very much. Um, and that brings us to resolutions, which there are none. There are no notices of motion. And that will conclude our meeting for the Municipal, non municipal Nonprofit Housing Corporation Board of Directors. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, folks. Have a great day, everyone.